All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Whitney Isola, and I am a co-founder of Oncopower. Uh, we are a community that is building tools to support oncology care for both patients and providers. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. So tonight we're kicking off a new series in 2022, and that is uh, hosted by our registered dietitian on the platform, Rachel Spencer. So I've had the pleasure of working with Rachel in the past. She's a phenomenal clinician. Um, she did her training at Boston University and uh, went on to work in New York City Health and Hospitals, the largest public safety net hospital system in the country. Um, she is a certified nutrition support clinician and, um, you know, and mama to a very adorable young son. And uh, we are very lucky to have her at Anka Power. So I'm going to let her lead the charge. We're going to, the format tonight is she's going to talk about um, inflammation um, and its role in, in cancer development and care um, and how nutrition plays into that. And then, uh, and then we're going to sort of open it up to Q&A. We already have some really fantastic questions, so we're excited. So Rachel, why don't you start us off? Thank you so much, Whitney. That was an excellent introduction. And thank you for mentioning my son because I just heard him get home from daycare. So he's in the other room. If you hear any loud, loud yells, that's definitely him. Um, so yeah, as, uh, as Whit mentioned, we are going to be talking about inflammation tonight. Um, and so inflammation gets talked about a lot. It's a word that gets kind of thrown out um, kind of all around and lots of people don't even really know what it means. So inflammation is just the body's immune response to any kind of insult or any kind of stress. Um, this can be short term or also known as acute inflammation. This would be like if you cut your finger slicing an onion, if you burned your hand, if you were exposed to some pollen outdoors, um, or if you were in a room with someone who had a cold um, and were exposed to those germs. So your immune system would appropriately respond to fight off or repair any of that damage. So that's the good kind of inflammation. That's the kind we want. Um, the kind of inflammation that is not so good is called is the longer term inflammation or chronic inflammation. Um, and that would be the kind, it can arise from a lot of different factors. Tonight, we're gonna be talking about diet. So poor diet um, can help um, raise inflammation levels, um, poor sleep, lack of exercise, exposure to chemicals like those in cigarette smoke or alcohol or uh, pesticides, things like that. Um, and we want to try to reduce those kind of exposures to keep that chronic inflammation low. When our inflammation levels are higher, it makes different kinds of stress hormones and chemicals circulate around in our bodies. And if those low levels persist for a long time, it can do damage to our cells and our tissues. Um, and over time that can lead to many different kinds of chronic disease, most notably cancer, um, which is the topic that we're mostly focusing on tonight, but it can also, inflammation levels have also been tied to diabetes, dementia, heart disease. So those are the kinds of things that we obviously want to prevent. Um, now focusing in on diet, since that is my specialty. Um, normal digestion and metabolism of different kinds of foods is going to expose your body to different um, natural body chemicals and different hormones. Um, but when we're eating foods that aren't necessarily or, or would be considered pro-inflammatory causing inflammation, um, that's gonna be the issue. Um, so when these are broken down, um, they may exert different effects. For example, if you're eating a lot of food um, that's really high in sugar or refined carbohydrates, think white bread, lots of candy, soda, things like that, um, it's going to lead your body to have a higher than normal insulin and insulin like growth factor response, which has been showed to lead to higher cell growth and turnover, and it can um, cause it can cause cancer. So by having all of those extra extra sugar molecules uh -huh. floating around. Our testing system. Um, Additionally, um, lots of different kinds of oils are known as pro-inflammatory. So those would be the kinds of things um, like safflower, corn oil. They have fats called omega-6, um, which are known to raise inflammation, as opposed to um, the omega-3 oils, um, such as those found in flax seeds, chia seeds, salmon, other cold water fish. Those are known to be anti-inflammatory. So there's a couple of different ways that foods can affect um, our inflammation uh, levels. So our 
um, our goal is to try to reduce the amount of processed foods because it's generally the processed foods that have the things that increase our levels. They're gonna have all those different kinds of processed oils. They're gonna have lots of extra sugar and salt that are going to you know, kind of naturally raise our inflammation levels. Um, and we wanna choose more unprocessed whole foods, um, things that look as close as possible to the way that they came out of the ground. So think eat a potato chip instead of having, or eat a potato instead of having potato chips, having an apple instead of drinking apple juice, that kind of thing. Um, while we're on this topic, I think it's important to discuss antioxidants because um, that also gets thrown around and people just kind of, you know, say just not along with the word antioxidant, don't really know what it means. Um, so antioxidants are a large group of compounds, including, you know, different vitamins like vitamins A, E, and C, um, and other kinds of chemicals called phytonutrients. Antioxidants they fight against something called a free radical in your body. Um, and free radicals kind of float around and they do damage to the DNA in your cells, which um, if left unchecked can, can cause altered um, cell growth and, and can cause cancer. So these antioxidants, by taking them in either through food or supplements, they fight against those free radicals um, and prevent those harmful effects from occurring. One group of antioxidants that I did mention was phytonutrients. Um, so phytonutrient just means plant nutrients. Um, they have a whole bunch of other different names, um, anthoxanthins, phenols, lignans, flavonoids, um, all different kinds of sciencey things. All that it basically means is that they're super good for you. They do a host of different kinds of events, most of which are anti-cancer in nature. Um, so some of them, some of them act as antioxidants, like I mentioned. Some of them uh, change the way that different genes are regulated. Um, some of them um, control blood glucose levels. They they act in a whole bunch of different ways. But generally speaking, um, those phytonutrients and antioxidants are highest in your dark, brightly pigmented foods. Um, so think like sweet potatoes, blueberries, um, tomatoes, those kinds of things are going to be the highest in our antioxidants and our phytonutrients, generally going to be best for our inflammation levels. Since we already started talking about specific foods, um, an anti-inflammatory diet, it's it's not a diet in the sense that it's going to cause you to lose weight. Um, uh, we're just using the word diet to mean eating pattern, which sometimes gets a little bit confusing. Um, most of the time when you're watching the news and talking about a diet, people are talking about weight loss, especially in January when people are talking about New Year's resolutions. Um, but an anti-inflammatory diet just means that you are making the best food choices for your inflammation levels and to have the best health outcomes. So the base, um, of anti any anti-inflammatory diet is going to be those brightly colored, deeply pigmented fruits and vegetables. And you wanna to try to get at least five or upwards of five if you can, different kinds of fruits and vegetables every day. Variety is key here because we wanna get all of those different beautiful colors, the whole rainbow. Um, and we also wanna have that high amount. So five to seven is a lot more than most people eat in a day, but it's really, that's what's going to make sure that you're getting those antioxidants and phytonutrients. It's also gonna make sure that your fiber intake is pretty high. Um, lots of research has shown that a high fiber diet is beneficial um, in terms of in terms of cancer, but also in terms of other different kinds of chronic diseases as well. So that base is those different brightly colored fruits and vegetables. You also want to make sure that you are getting a wide variety of whole grains. Um, so those are the ones that are generally, if it has brown in front of it or whole in front of it, those are your whole grains. So brown rice, whole wheat, um, kind of fancier grains like barley and spelt and amaranth, quinoa. Um, those are going to have, again, high fiber and lots of other good nutrients in them. For our protein choices, we mainly want to stick to lean poultry, such as chicken or turkey, lots of that fatty cold water fish like salmon and sardines. Um, eggs are okay. Um, we do want to make sure that we are getting some whole soy foods as soy has, um, it's called soy or isoflavones in it, which is beneficial to a lot of different kinds of cancer, um, as well as general health maintenance. Um, and we also want to make sure that we are getting lots of beans and other kinds of like lentils and pulses as they're a really high fiber, really satiating choice um, for your protein needs. 
um, foods that you might want to avoid, as we kind of mentioned before, those would be those kind of high sugar, high processed foods, anything that comes in like a bag or a box is generally going to be something that you want to have less often. Um, processed meats like bacon and sausage definitely should be something that you have as little as possible. Um, those have been directly linked to colon cancer. Um, and um, what else? Oh, alcohol. Um, again, a new year, lots of new resolutions going on. Alcohol is something that it, it's known to be carcinogenic, but if you do choose to drink alcohol, you're really gonna wanna stick to just one drink a day if you are a woman or two drinks a day if you're a man. And if that drink is red wine, all the better because there has been some beneficial effects um, shown with red wine. Obviously better not to drink at all, but if you are gonna drink, that's gonna be your best drink of choice. So that diet pattern, the anti-inflammatory diet pattern, as I just described, it's inherently super high in fiber, super high in antioxidants, it's low glycemic index, all of which have been linked to cancer prevention um, or prevention of reoccurrence. So if you adopt a lot of these changes, it's a, it's a lot different than a lot of people eat, but sometimes it sounds familiar. So all of those foods that I mentioned, they kind of all are in the Mediterranean diet, which was just named the best diet of 2022 for the fifth year in a row. Um, so if it's easier uh, to remember or easier to find resources on the Mediterranean diet, it's pretty much the same thing as an anti-inflammatory diet. You're gonna get a lot of those benefits, a lot of those anti-cancer, anti-heart uh, disease benefits by following a Mediterranean diet the same way as if you followed the diet that I just described. So that is the overview and it was really fast. I talk really fast. I used to live in New York. Um, that is the overview of inflammation and an anti-inflammatory diet and the effect that inflammation can have on cancer. So at this point, um, we'd like to open it up to questions. Um, they're down on the bottom of the screen. There's a little chat box. You can feel free to type your questions right in there. Whitney will be um, kind of reading through, combing through, um, and she'll be asking me directly the questions, right? Is that the, we're good with? Game plan. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, very nice overview. I'm sure that that helps sort of fill in the picture of inflammation for a lot of people. Um, we have a few questions that were submitted um, ahead of time. So I'm going to start off with those as some drop into the chat. So a question from Julia. I am a breast cancer patient still going on um, on chemotherapy. What's the best food and vitamins for me to take? Yeah, so this is a good question. A lot of people ask. So breast cancer is obviously, unfortunately, very, very common. Um, and a lot of um a lot of our questions that I saw come in ahead of time were about breast cancer. So specific to breast cancer, um, the couple of things that you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you are doing is monitoring your weight. Um, it's, breast cancer is one of the few where people are likely to gain weight during treatment. Um, and it's a little bit, um, the research shows that the more weight that you gain, if you gain more than around 12 or 15 pounds, um, you have worse outcomes. So you want to make sure that your weight gain stays somewhere under that 12 to 15 pound mark. Um, you don't necessarily have to lose weight um, during your treatment, but it can be beneficial and it can be something that is discussed with your doctor. Um, so that's the first kind of thing um, that I would talk about is just general weight maintenance during breast cancer treatment. Um, the next thing that I would want to mention again is that soy isoflavone piece that I mentioned. Um, so soy gets a little bit of a, it's kind of was debated, um, whether or not breast cancer patients should be having soy because it does have plant estrogen in it. And lots of types of breast cancers are responsive to estrogen or they have re estrogen receptors on the cells. But it's really important to note that the kind of estrogen that's in soy is totally different and acts totally different in the body than, than human estrogen does. Um, and what it, it will actually block, latch on to the breast cancer cells and block the estrogen from getting in there, which can have beneficial effects. So patients with breast cancer are encouraged to have at least one to two servings of a whole soy food product every day. So that could be soy milk, tofu, edamame, um, tempeh, anything like that is going to be a good soy choice. Um, you want to generally steer away from like soy protein powders, soy, soy isolate, 
um, just because that hasn't been as well studied with its effect on breast cancer. Additionally, there's been some pretty good research on flax seeds. Um, so flax seeds are really high in one of those phytonutrients I talked about called lignans. Um, and so it's generally recommended that all women, um, but especially women with breast cancer, have one to three tablespoons of ground soybean or uh, flaxseed meal every day. Um, so that's a really good source of those omega-3 fats. It's going to have those lignans, um, and it's also a good source of fiber. So you get a one, two, three punch of good cancer fighting medicine with some flax seeds. In terms of vitamins to take, I know that was kind of the second part of Julia's question. Um, it depends. So with all cancers, before you decide to take any, any vitamins, any supplements, any herbal products, you should always discuss with your doctor. And I know I'm going to say that probably 18 times today. Um, but each person's, you know, suite of medications that they're on is very different. And a lot of those different herbs, especially the herbal products are going to have different interactions with different kinds of medicine. So you always want to make sure that if you decide to take something, it's safe and that it's not interfering with your cancer treatment itself. Um, that being said, there is a little bit of research that says that breast cancer patients specifically, if they take a multivitamin three times a week, it doesn't have to be every day, just three times a week, that it can have beneficial effects for your treatment. You just want to make sure that that vitamin supplement is good quality, that it's from a reputable source, um, and that it's not going to be contaminated with anything because that's, that has, um, happened in the past. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that that really helped Julia with her, with her concerns. Uh, so first question from the group, this is from Prakash. How important is a vegan diet? Okay. Um, so a vegan diet for those who aren't aware, a vegan diet is one that totally leaves out all animal products. Um, so there's no dairy, there's no eggs, there's no meat, there's no fish. Um, some vegans go even as strict to not having any honey um, or not wearing any leather products. Um, people can decide to be vegan because of environmental concerns or, um, or it can be for health um, reasons. The research shows that a plant-based diet is going to have the best effects for any kind of cancer prevention or during cancer treatment, anything like that. A plant-based diet does not mean entirely vegan. It does not mean entirely leaving out all animal products. So it just means shifting more of your, of your kinds of foods that you're eating to a plant-based source. So if you, you know, if you switch your dairy milk, if you switch it to a soy milk, that's a really good choice, right? Because you're going to get a serving of whole soy foods and you're going to be kind of skewing that dairy product, maybe in your morning coffee or with your cereal or oatmeal or whatever. Um, but, you know, salmon is really high in omega-3. So if you want to have salmon a couple of times a week, that's totally fine. Um, if you, if it's really culturally important to you to have, you know, a certain dish with chicken or beef in it, that's totally fine. And that can fit in a plant-based meal pattern. It's just about shifting a higher percentage of your, your food products that you're having onto, onto a plant-based source. Um, so a vegan diet, it can work. It's really restrictive, especially during cancer treatment. If you're having a lot of symptoms and you're not feeling very well, it can be really hard to get adequate nutrition during a vegan diet. Um, but it is certainly something that if you're working really closely with your care team, it can be done but it's completely not necessary to have a successful cancer treatment course. <laughs> Very helpful. I mean, I, I think it's so interesting to see all of the plant forward messaging that comes nowadays, and it's definitely relevant in terms of cancer care. Yeah, and I do wanna just mention aside, so plant-based is a really, especially here in the US, it's like the marketing about it, it's like everywhere. Um, and I recently purchased a bar of soap that said plant-based on it. So, you know, great. It's like, it's like what gluten-free was 10 years ago. <laughs> it was I like... think the soap even said non-GMO. <laughs> uh, Devota says, hello, good morning and happy new year. So happy new year to you. <laughs> uh, what can you say about flavonoids? 
So flavonoids, they are one of those phytonutrients that I mentioned, um, and they are going to be definitely anti-cancer, definitely anti-inflammatory. It's not something that you need to take as a supplement. Um, it's not something that you really have to think too much about in terms of, you know, specifically getting a certain kind of flavonoid. Um, I would say that if you're including a lot of those richly colored foods in your diet, sweet potatoes, pomegranates, you know, collards, kale, um, and having lots of good um, nuts and seeds, then you're going to be getting adequate phytonutrients. I think that there's a lot of hullabaloo about specific ones. Um, I know curcumin gets talked a lot about in the inflammation world. And so curcuminoid is the, um, is the phytonutrient that's in curcumin. Um, and there is really good data to show that it's super anti-inflammatory, but it's um, I think that if you include cumin in some of your cooking, um, you know, if you make a curry with sweet potatoes and spinach and all of these different kinds of foods that I mentioned, I think that's generally appropriate. Um, I think that supplements are something that, um, it's a, you know, multi-billion dollar industry. And I think people make a lot of money off of different specific supplements. Um, and a whole food approach is one that I advocate. So really just choosing all of those different beautiful foods, um, that's really going to be your best bet. Um, we had two questions come through, one from Karen and one from Lourdes. And um, they're very similar. So I'll, I'll ask both, but kind of in a fragmented way. Um, so both mentioned being estrogen positive, um, breast can having estrogen positive breast cancer. And um, one asked about if they can currently eat soy, um, you know, with an ERPR positive breast cancer. And one asked about survivorship. They said they're eight years post chemo and they were told to avoid soy. So could you comment on if there's any level of safe or if that information is still relevant? Yeah, good question. Um, so, Definitely, my understanding of the literature is that soy is safe. Um, you know, in Asian cultures, um, people have been eating soy multiple, multiple servings a day and their rates of breast cancer are actually lower than Western cultures. Um, so to me, that kind of long range data, even if it's not, you know, a specifically done study, it's pretty good evidence that it's safe for, for people, certainly before, um, before treatment. Um, I think that, you know, once the data, again, the data that I've reviewed says that soy, once you're diagnosed with breast cancer is safe. Again, that soy estrogen, it locks onto the cancer cells in a totally different way than okay. your body's estrogen does. And it blocks a lot of the action that would be induced by your own body's estrogen. Um, as far as, well, congratulations on your survivorship eight years out after chemo. That's a very wonderful, glad to hear it. Um, you know, I would hesitate to go against anything that your physician has said, because I'm not sure what research they're basing that recommendation on. Um, however, again, my understanding is that soy is safe. Um, if it, makes you nervous, then it's not something that you have to include. Um, there's lots of other ways to get a lot of those good benefits. Um, and that would be certainly a discussion that if you, you know, if you sign up for Onco Power and you wanted to speak with me one-on-one um, -on -one and we could kind of go over what your physician said and, and what he was basing it on, then we could absolutely do that. But um, so my understanding is that soy is safe at all, at all stages of breast cancer, whether before, during, or after. Um, but it's not something that you necessarily need to have in your diet. Hmm. Um, so Bridget wants to know about coffee. And I, I'm curious myself, what do you suggest regarding having coffee? So I, so luckily the research backs me up on this, but coffee is excellent for you. It really, truly is. There's a lot of, so there's a lot of good research. Um, I think a lot of it comes out of Scandinavia where they drink like all, 
like I think Sweden drinks like the most coffee out of like anywhere in the world. It's like really weird. But um, something like if you drink up to five cups of coffee a day, it reduces your more your all cause mortality. So dying from anything up to five cups a day, your mortality is down. Um, specifically in the cancer world, um, your uh, let's see, prostate cancer coffee is protective. Um, I think that colon cancer coffee is protective. There's a lot of good, I mean, depending on how high of quality your coffee is, it's also going to make a difference, um, and how you're brewing it. But, um, there's a lot of good antioxidants that are in coffee. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're grinding your own beans, you're releasing all of that good freshness, you're brewing it. Um, I mean, I use a drip one, but, um, you know, you're brewing it. It's not like sitting on the, the, the heater for too long, you know, just kind of boiling into like black tar. Um, it's definitely going to be beneficial. What you do want to be careful with is what you are putting into your coffee. Um, so coffee by itself, super, super good, very anti-cancer have up to, you know, three cups a day. I think it's going to be no problem as long as you're not having any GI issues. Um, if you are putting a bunch of cream in your coffee, a bunch of sugar in your coffee, if you're getting a frappuccino with extra whip and whatever, it's no longer coffee, right? Like that's soda. At that point, you're adding a ton of fat into it's soda or ice cream. You're adding like a lot of fat, a lot of sugar into it. Um, and that is not going to be nearly as beneficial and could in fact be harmful and raise your inflammation risk, um, causing weight gain. And that weight gain could in itself cause cancer. Um, because we know that excess weight, carrying excess weight around is the second, second leading cause of um, many different types of cancer in the Western world behind smoking. Um, so those really sugary, fatty coffee drinks are something that can um, really be a risk factor. So that's something you would want to watch out for. Otherwise, coffee is fine. There's a lot of good research for green tea as well. So if that's a beverage that you do enjoy consuming, having one to two cups a day can also be beneficial. Hmm, helpful. I love green tea, actually. I just never think to drink it because I like my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Marie says, is fenugreek good for breast cancer? Fenugreek. Um, so this is honestly, so this is a hole in my knowledge and I always have to reference sources. So Marie, if you join Onco Power and ask me this question, I can get back to you. Um, we as healthcare providers have to be, you know, have a knowledge base of hundreds and hundreds of different things and herbs is just one that like, I always have to look up. Um, so, it, so I cannot say specifically, I apologize for that at this moment. Um, but generally speaking, herbs are safe generally, but this is something that you want to always talk to your care team about your, your, whoever prescribes your medications, because there are certain medications like St. John's wort, um, lots of, um, lots of other different herbs, they interact with different medications and can even make them less effective or build up in your body and cause toxicity. So always talk to your care team before. Um, I have access, your care team should have access to all different kinds of databases where we can reference and look at your medications and see if there's going to be any kinds of interactions. Yeah, so important. Um, I can't quite read the name because the username is very long. Um, I'm a breast cancer patient, ERPR positive. Can I still use oil in my cooking, such as olive oil? Yeah, good question. Um, so you absolutely can still use oil and you should. So cooking oils like olive oil and avocado oil um, are going to be beneficial. They're going to have a really nice ratio of different kinds of fats that are going to be anti-inflammatory. Um, you want to be careful with cooking oils like corn oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, um, because those have kind of bad um, fatty acid profiles and they can raise your inflammation. But cooking with olive oil, especially extra virgin olive oil is gonna be just perfect. It's gonna add that nice flavor. Um, it's also going to add a little bit of extra calories. And sometimes during treatment, we know that we need a couple of extra calories. So you can always ramp up that amount of oil that's in your dishes as well. So building off of that, Liza says that she's also a breast cancer patient, ERPR positive, um, post chemo for 10 months. Um, and praise God, no manifestation of any cancer cells. Congratulations, Liza. Um, is chicken and beef okay? 
Yeah. So in terms of protein sources, your lean poultry, so chicken and turkey, um, no skin on it. It's going to be totally fine. Um, there's really no recommendations on how much is too much. Um, so having some animal protein, some of that poultry every day should be just fine. Um, in terms of beef, that's something that you want to kind of limit to maybe like once a week, twice a week, um, because we do know that red meat is pretty strongly linked to different kinds of cancer, um, not necessarily to breast cancer itself, but we always want to be on the lookout for um, things that we can prevent moving forward. And if you're, you know, if there's no signs of cancer now, we want to make sure that there's no signs of cancer, especially anywhere else in your body. Um, so those red meats, um, like beef and lamb and pork, um, and especially those processed meats. So bacon, sausage, ham, um, those are the ones that are directly linked to causing colorectal cancer. Um, and just kind of in their digestion, they raise your inflammation. Um, so it's something you want to have less of. Other good uh, protein options would be um, beans and legumes and lentils, um, as those are going to have those good, um, that good amount of fiber to help feed those gut bacteria and decrease your inflammation um, levels. And then you um, can also choose um, those soy foods like I talked about. Um, eggs are also a good protein source and those, those fatty cold water fish. Those are also good ways to get in your protein. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have a devota in the Philippines and she, um, talks about how her parents are cancer survivors. Father had stage four prostate cancer. Mother had stage two breast cancer. They had regular diets, even when they had no appetite brought about by chemo. Um, it's been a significant amount of time since they've had their cancers. And, um, she actually says that she is a, an RD in the Philippines, um, so any sort of commentary on family history and inflammation and, and things that people might want to look out for? Um, so generally speaking, I mean, you always want to make sure that you have a good understanding of your family history of any kinds of diseases. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, luck of the draw as I mean, my understanding of cancer is, if, if you have a strong family history, then you're always gonna want to get those extra screening done, so maybe have a genetic workup done, um, but your oncologist should always be, or your, your primary care physician should always be kind of having that conversation with you about what kind of screenings are appropriate. Um, and if you do have a strong family history, then it's even more important that you follow, um, you follow a healthy lifestyle, including diet. Um, I'd like to make a plug for, you know, all of the other different kinds of lifestyle modifications that are really important to reducing your inflammation and your chronic disease risk. Um, so making sure that you are, um, I'd like to say moving your body with intention, um, which is a nicer way of saying exercising, um, for at least 150 minutes a week. So that's half an hour, five days a week. Um, it can be, you know, cleaning the house pretty vigorously going on kind of a faster paced walk with your dog, um, playing out in the yard with your kids. All of those things count as physical activity and can be beneficial for your inflammation levels. Um, making sure that you are having good sleep habits, um, is huge. So making, you know, the, the levels of inflammation when you have bad sleep um, or your sleep is off is crazy. The rates of breast cancer occurrence in night shift workers is like, I think it's something close to twice as high as people who work a day shift. So that, that sleep regulation is super important. Um, otherwise making sure that your stress levels are regulated, um, you know, by whatever means necessary, usually getting physical activity can help those stress levels too. Um, so, you know, finding out that you have a strong family history is one thing, and then making conscious decisions to, um, to doing everything you can to kind of combat that predisposition. Um, so having a really strong, high quality diet, making those good choices about your other lifestyle and getting your screenings on time. Um, those are going to be the recommendations I would have if you find out that you have a strong family history. Yeah, definitely. S solid advice for, for anyone and every one of us. Mm -hmm. um, Neji says, I have stage four colorectal cancer. I'm taking Ensure Gold only um, for my daily meals. Uh, do you have any suggestion for healthy foods? Sure. So 
So you might be out of the, I've never heard of Ensure Gold, but I am familiar with the, with the Abbott product Ensure. Um, so it is a, it's something that we call an oral nutritional supplement. So it's, it's designed to be an addition to healthy foods. Um, it's not necessarily designed to be the only thing that you are taking in. Um, it's usually used when people are having really poor appetites. Maybe they're suffering from certain um, side effects or, you know, their metabolism is just super high and they need the extra calories. So I would say that you definitely need to eat food in addition to having those supplements. Um, and kind of the foods that I laid out here um, are, are going to be a good place to start. Um, making sure that you're building your plate with, you know, one of those good lean proteins I talked about, some whole grains, whole grain rice, whole, whole wheat pasta, barley, lentils, things like that. Um, and then like half the plate, fully half the plate should be those brightly colored fruits and vegetables to make sure that you're getting in all those good cancer fighting um, properties. If you're having symptoms from your treatment, um, whether it's chemotherapy, radiation, immunotherapy, whatever it is, um, sometimes we do have to modify this diet. And I think it's important to give yourself a little bit of grace um, if, you know, if your appetite is super poor, if you're feeling nauseous, maybe today's, you know, this week isn't the week that you're gonna eat amazing and super anti-inflammatory and according to like the rule book. And that's totally fine. I think the most important thing is that you are eating. Um, you always need to make sure that you are nourishing yourself so that you can be the strongest version to continue on with your treatment and continue on with your cancer process. Um, and if that means that today you're going to have, you know, mashed potatoes and fried chicken, and because that's what sounds good, that's okay. Um, maybe later on in the day, once you get a little bit of strength back, maybe then you can have some soup um, with, you know, some vegetables and something a little bit more nourishing to your body as well. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all a balancing act and those supplements, like I said, they, they definitely do have a role um, and they're definitely healthy, but you, you always want to think about the, the whole foods. Um, that should be the base of your diet as well. Uh, we actually have some vitamin questions coming in. So Chandra says, I heard that vitamin C in massive doses is good for cancer patients. Is this true? So vitamin C is one of those antioxidants, like I talked about. Um, so they're going to fight against the free radicals that cause damage to the DNA in our cells. Um, I would strongly caution against taking large doses of any vitamin. Um, the, because it is an antioxidant, um, it's going to, the mechanism that it works by can sometimes interfere with different cancer treatments actually. So if you're on a certain kind of cancer treatment and you're taking super high vitamin C, it can make the, vi make the cancer treatment less effective. Um, your body doesn't need mega doses of anything. It needs just the right amount of everything. Um, so if vitamin C is something that you're worried about, um, you know, you can always eat food sources that are really high in vitamin C, um, strawberries, red bell peppers, oranges, obviously, um, I think broccoli is weirdly high in vitamin C. Um, and those food sources, you're only, your body is only going to absorb as much as you need. And then you're also going to get the benefit of the fiber and all of the other different antioxidants and phytonutrients that are in those, those foods as well. Um, if you do feel like you need to take a supplement, I would say just a regular multivitamin is fine for most people. Um, it's going to have, you know, about like a hundred percent of every, you know, vitamin that you need, and that should be just fine. Um, there's vitamin C is water soluble, meaning that it, it clings onto water in your body. And if there's extra, you just pee out the extra, but those mega doses, I would strongly caution against, especially, um, vitamin A, E, and C. Those ones are going to be not good to take in mega doses. And um, Gemma asks about vitamin D. I always hear about that. Is, is it important that I take that? So vitamin D is one of the only supplements that I recommend pretty much everyone to take. Um, of course, it is something that you need to discuss with your care team. They can draw some blood and check your levels. Um, but most people, especially here in the U.S., um, are really low in vitamin D and vitamin D is kind of like a workhouse horse of the body. Um, we used to think that it was really only involved in like bone health, um, and teeth health, but it's, it's tied to immunity. It's tied to respiratory function. Um, it's tied to different kinds of cell prol proliferation. So for cancer causing or cancer prevention, um, it's super important. Um, so most people I recommend to take a vitamin D supplement, you want to take vitamin D, uh, three. 
Um, that's the one that's best absorbed by the body. Um, but you should always talk to your care team and see how much you should be taking. Um, but I would definitely, that one, that one's the one that I tell people to take. <laughs> The other one, I'll just, I'll just say the other one that I usually tell people to take is omega-3, a fish oil supplement, um, because most people aren't actually eating enough fatty cold water fish. Um, so you want to take somewhere um, between, um, between two and three grams of fish oil a day, but fish oil is also something that interacts with your medication. So as always, talk to your care team before you start taking any supplements. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Prakash brings up a, a good point. Uh, is relaxation training and meditation important? So, so I am not certified or, you know, verified or anything in that, but through my reading about stress, um, relaxation is huge relaxation, meditation, mindfulness, um, Tai Chi and Qigong, all of those, um, a lot of those have shown really beneficial effects in patient quality of life. Um, fatigue levels, um, um, kind of like symptom management for some of the relaxation techniques. And there's a lot of good apps out there. Um, I know that there's um, one called relax with like a bunch of X's. Um, and that has been, that's really easy. It's on your phone. Um, there's Headspace, which is a meditation. I don't get paid by any of these people. I'm just naming <laughs> names, um, but they can be really beneficial. Yeah, I will. Um plug onco power for a second so we are um developing for the patient education section of the website we're developing some content that is specific to meditation and relaxation techniques um, and those are being developed by a professional um, that you know focuses on yoga and mindful to mindfulness and meditation and coaching um, so that content is going to be coming probably within the next month. Related to this, I did just read a study just for kind of everyone's information um, that the oncology centers that have the highest amount of integrative oncology. So those are centers that have a dietitian on staff that have, um, you know, a, a psycho oncologist that have these relaxation people, yoga instructors, acupuncture, all of these kind of complementary medicine features. The, the cancer centers that have the highest have the best outcomes too. Um, they have the highest rates of, um, you know, survivorship and longevity and, and lack of recurrence. So I think that there's a, there's a lot of, you know, traditional Western medicine is obviously going to be the cornerstone of, of curing any cancer, but a lot of these adjunct therapies are, are really beneficial, um, especially the ones that you can control yourself. So using those relaxation techniques, controlling your sleep, getting your physical activity and, and making sure that your diet is going to be as best as possible for you as well. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Edna says, I was diagnosed with stage one endometrial cancer. What is the right management and treatment plan? So that would be a really good question. Um, join OncoPower, use our Ask a Doc service. Um, you can submit all of your details and a certified US-based oncologist will get back to you um, with different treatment plan options for you. Um, I am unfortunately not a doctor. I'd get paid a lot more if I was, um, but that's a little bit out of my scope. As far as nutrition for a new cancer diagnosis, um, first of all, you wanna make sure that you are taking care of yourself um, and that you, um, you are eating. Um, sometimes the stress of a new diagnosis can really take away that appetite, but, you know, really try to get in some good nutrition, um, make sure that you're having at least, you know, two meals a day with a couple of snacks, um, and try to make sure that your, your body is as well prepared to, for the treatment ahead of it as possible. Um, another question about physical, um, activity, what are the most appropriate physical exercises for cancer patients? Um, and do you recommend any foods that are best to prevent the recurrence of colon cancer? So, um, I'm not a physical therapist just saying, but, um, you know, anything that you're, that you were doing before and that you feel able to do as far as physical activity, I think is what the recommendations are. I would refer you to speak to your doctor about what's safe for you, um, depending on whether or not you had surgery or your energy levels, things like that. Um, 
But as far as foods for colon cancer, um, you want to make sure um, that you're getting a high fiber diet as long as you're out from any surgeries that you had, as long as you're, you know, it's been a, a couple of weeks, a couple of months from any surgeries that you may have had, um, a high fiber diet is going to make sure that the bacteria in your gut are super happy and healthy. They can produce all the different kinds of chemicals that um, promote kind of a healthy colon environment um, and reduce the inflammation um, there around where the cancer occurred. Um, you also want to make sure that you are not having any red meat or any processed meat. If you know you have a history of colon cancer, why chance it? Really, those should be the things that you take out. Um, and then nuts um, are super good to, um, to fight against colon cancer. So a serving of nuts, like about a palm full of nuts. Um, has been shown to reduce colon cancer risk and recurrence. Um, so I think the best is like a mixed nut or like almonds, um, but even peanuts, peanut butter can be beneficial as well. It's good. They're really high in fiber. They've got really good fatty acids um, and lots of those good um, um, antioxidants as well. It makes so much sense, but I never really kind of connected the dots before on, on nuts, fiber and healthy fats. <laughs> I know. I know. And there's, there's such a good snack, especially if you, um, especially if you're like on the go, they're going to give you a lot of that good energy, the fiber and fat are going to keep you really full. Um, if your appetite is really poor, nuts can be great. If you're trying to gain weight, there is nothing better than peanut butter. You can like, if you're, if you're worried about your weight, if you've maybe lost a lot of weight from your treatment course, um, or, you know, you're trying to recover from surgery and you need some extra calories, keep a jar of peanut butter by you and just like scoop, scoop, scoop. It's super calorically dense and going to be really great to put that weight back on. Mm -hmm. Um, so food specific question, uh, Devota says, would you recommend cotton candy, berry, or era tiles. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and sea catfish to be included in the diet. I am actually going to have to look at that one to see how it's written. Cotton candy, berry, era tiles, or sea catfish. I don't know what any of those are. Um, Generally speaking, if, if cotton candy berry, if it's like a true berry, if it's not like something that's like a cotton candy jelly bean, um, if it's a cotton candy, if it's like a berry, like a raspberry or a strawberry, then that would be helpful, right? If it's a dark color, um, if it's, you know, if it's a true fruit, then that's going to be something that should absolutely be included. Um, Ara tiles, that one I'm going to have to look up. I apologize. Please ask me after the, after the event um, and sea catfish, I assume is some kind of seafood. Um, and so seafood generally, okay. As long as it's not battered and fried um, and usually pretty beneficial. Like I said, those fatty cold water fish, mackerel and salmon and sardines and, you know, shrimp or even uh, pretty high in omega-3, which is going to be anti-inflammatory, good source of protein. Um, so I apologize. There are a ton, a ton of um, cultural foods out there in the world. And unfortunately I can't know everything. Um, but generally <laughs> speaking, if I hope that answers the question, we'll give you a pass this time. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> um, Liza says, uh, is MSM shiitake, selenium, milk, thistle, and vitamin E, uh, good supplements for breast cancer that are ERPR positive breast cancers post chemo? So always want to refer to your physician before you take taking any supplements just due to any kinds of interactions. Um, if you are having, there's a lot of research done on the kind of medicinal mushrooms right now. Um, so like reishi and turkey tail and, and you know, all of lion's mane, things like that. Um, Generally speaking, if you eat them or take them as a tea, they're pretty safe. Um, lots of them are being studied for their anti-cancer effects, but a lot of that data is coming out of cell studies, um, not human studies. So we can't necessarily say that what happens in a Petri dish is going to happen in a person. Um, but if you're having kind of, you know, a normal amount of them, if you're drinking it in a tea or, you know, eating it in a stir fry, then that's going to be generally fine. Um, milk thistle. I'm pretty sure that that's fine um, for breast cancer. 
a lot of these, it's what you're really going to want to make sure. And what's kind of the hard answer to give generally is you want to make sure that you're taking the right dose and that you want to make sure that the extract that you're getting is going to be the, you know, the right, the right extract and not contaminated by things. Um, and a vitamin E supplement, vitamin E is one of those antioxidants that I would be careful about only because it is, um, if you take too high of a dose, it's actually shown to be, you know, harmful in effect. Um, but the amount of vitamin E that's in a multivitamin is going to be just fine. Selenium is, um, definitely going to be fine to take again, the amount that's in a multivitamin is just fine. Lots of people are low in selenium, uh, and selen low selenium levels have been tied to, um, to cancer risk. So that's one that, that makes sense. Interestingly, if you eat two Brazil nuts, just two a day, that's like all of your selenium. It's like all the selenium you would ever need. So if you're eating those nuts that are going to have that good fiber and the good fats, and it's a Brazil nut, then you're going to get all your selenium too. Um, but again, all of those questions, if they're really specific like that about the specific supplements, always want to talk to your care team. But those are really good questions to be asked on our platform on OncoPower, um, because then I have a little bit more time to use my databases and give really thorough, detailed answers to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Um, kind of building off of that, um, someone wanted to know uh, that they've they wrote that they've read articles that vitamin B17 is good for cancer patients. Is it true? And what are the foods with vitamin B17? So that's a very interesting question. So I have not done any reading on B17. I know that you can get B complex with kind of the more common ones, um, thiamine, riboflavin, you know, cyan, cobalamin, things like that. Um, so I would have to look into that for you, B17. Um, this is the kind of complicated thing. And I, you know, as a cancer patient, it's, you know, you're on the internet and you're looking for these answers and you're reading articles and you're reading blog posts and who's to know who's credible, right? Unless it's, you know, you can always trust information that is on big cancer centers. So MD Anderson, Sloan Kettering, um, uh, oh my gosh, the one in Boston, yeah. totally blanking. Thank Dana you, <laughs> Dana Farber. Um, any information that's found on those websites is going to be totally credible, totally fact-checked. Um, anything from the American Institute on Cancer Research, the American Cancer Society, that's going to be factual, evidence-based information. That's where I would go to for any kind of research that I'm doing. Um, anyone can post anything on the internet. Um, and a lot of the research that's emerging if it's, you know, about this B-17, for example, it could be true, right? But maybe there's only one or three or 10 studies done on it. And they were in really small populations or populations that weren't applicable to you. So interpreting that data is something that needs to be done really carefully um, to make sure that you are applying it to, um, to the correct patient population that needs to be taking it. Um, because what may be good for Breast cancer patients may be totally different for someone who has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, may be totally different for someone who like also is a diabetic and is taking insulin. So it's, we just want to be careful when there's emerging data and emerging research, especially if it hasn't really been done in human subjects, like people walking around eating and breathing, taking pills versus people putting drops of B17 onto a Petri dish. But I can look that up for you and get back. Okay, that's very thorough response. I appreciate that. Um, two more questions for the night, and then we're going to wrap this up. So Rome wants to know, is it okay to drink raw blended vegetables and fruits like carrots, celery, um, and apples while on chemo? So juicing is something that is super common and super popular because you know, me describing eating all of these fruits and vegetables, you know, trying to get five to seven a day, lots of bright colors, Sometimes people without an appetite, they're like, there's no way that I could do that, but I want to get all the nutrients. So juicing can be a good option. Um, the only thing that's a little bit, it's not quite the same 
having lots of juice is not quite the same as eating all of that stuff, like say in a big salad, because you're missing out on most of that fiber, you're missing out on the satiating effect of chewing, you're missing out on um, kind of the, the fullness sensation. Um, so generally speaking, yeah, you could juice um, as long as you're making sure that you're not putting too much fruit in there, um, because you can often end up taking in way more sugar than you originally intend to. If you put in, you know, like a handful of berries and a banana and an apple and some pineapple, like you would never sit down and eat that much fruit in a sitting, you would explode. Um, but it's super easy to drink all of that sugar. So that's one place I would be careful. The other place I would be careful is if you're doing any kind of raw food, um, you want to make sure that there aren't any precautions that your doctor wants to take. Um, say if you're a little bit immunocompromised, um, we want to make sure that we're practicing really good food safety. Um, so washing all of our fruits and vegetables really well. Um, if your doctor has directed you, you know, not to have any of those of if any raw, if everything needs to be cooked, um, just for food safety concerns, then, then juicing wouldn't be for you. Um, but generally speaking, juicing is fine. Um, as long as you're not drinking, you know, like a pint glass full of juice, you're having a juice glass full of juice. Um, and over the course of the day, that could be a, one way that you get in your vegetables, but most of the time you should be eating your vegetables, not drinking them. Um, and last question of the evening. So Rodora wants to know, uh, sugar serves as food for cancer cells, but I would want to know if I can use honey as an alternative for table sugar for my green tea. So sugar is something that I can't believe it's the last question of the night because it always comes up. People are crazy about sugar. Um, so it's true. So cancer cells take up a ton, a ton of sugar as their main source of energy. But we all have sugar circulating in our body. It is our body's main source of energy. And if you're regulating your sugar appropriately, right? Like if you don't have diabetes, if you don't have insulin resistance, if you don't have metabolic syndrome, if your cancer isn't located somewhere that's causing any weird glucose sensitivity issues, then having white table sugar in your tea, as long as it's, you know, one teaspoon, it should be fine. If you want to use honey, that's also totally fine. Um, your body doesn't really know the difference between honey and sugar, but you, if you like the taste of it, then you can totally go ahead. Um, what you do want to be careful of is having tons of sugar, right? Like tons of sugar at once, tons of sugar all the time. That's going to cause your blood glucose levels to be high all of the time, which can cause excess growth and excess um, cancer cell production. There's a lot of research right now in fasting. Um, so maybe, you know, eating only eight hours or 12 hours a day, or maybe eating every other day um, as a way to control your blood glucose levels and your insulin levels as a way to um, improve cancer outcomes. And there's also a lot of research on a ketogenic diet. So having a super low carbohydrate, super low sugar diet, um, in order to starve those cancer cells, um, because they pretty much only use sugar as their fuel source. They can't use ketones, um, as their fuel source. So there's research going on there. It's still a little bit, you know, up in the air as to whether or not it's, it's truly beneficial. Um, but I would say if you want to use honey in your tea, go ahead. As long as it's only a teaspoon, if you prefer white sugar, go ahead, as long as it's only a teaspoon. It's the amount that's really important, not necessarily the type of what sweetener you're using. All right. Well, Rachel, this has been really informative. Um, and everyone, I want to say thank you so much for all of your engagement and, and interesting questions. Um, I absolutely love learning during these. So Rachel's going to be hosting us every Tuesday in January. So her next session is going to be January 11th at the same time. Um, and so we look forward to having you join. That session is going to be on symptom management. So it's going to be the same format where she sort of tees us up for the topic for the night. And then we just want to hear from you and answer all of your questions. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your week and um, do tune into Onco Power. Come join us, come chat, come engage. Um, Cause really, you know, we're building this, you know this world of information for you. So thank you.